So what I presented here um, at the conference actually results that we haven't published uh, yet, in which we systematically searched for all the available literature that links um, the vaginal microbiome to the acquisition of HPV infection, but also the progression from HPV infection to epithelial premalignant lesions and eventually also to neoplasia. Firstly, we reviewed all the more recent uh, sequencing-based microbiome uh, data, but the, the vaginal microbiome is quite unique if you compare it to other body niches, and as much that um, the vaginal microbiome has been studied in non, by non-PCR-based methods for, let's say, like the past uh, 25 years. It's quite different from the gut or the oral microbiome. And so on. Um, this is the older literature, let's say, the, the, the method to, to assess this biosis is somewhat less refined than we hope to, to achieve with, with 16S-based sequencing. Um, but still, it, there's a body of evidence out there that is now somewhat sounding older um, and therefore often overlooked. So that is why we, we specifically aimed to look at the more recent sequencing-based data as well as to the older uh, body of, of uh, evidence. The, the vaginal microbiome is quite unique in as much that in ecology in general, outside the human body, but especially in, in for most human microbiome sites, that health is closely related to the diversity of the microbiome. It's quite the opposite in the vaginal microbiome, where, where what we consider a healthy microbiome with regard to all health outcomes that we have studied thus far, like preterm birth, acquisition of HIV and, and so on, um, it is uh, the low diversity, lactobacillus dominated microbiome, that is the most protective one. It gets more diverse. It's more what we call dysbiosis. So it's quite the opposite of what we know, for instance, for the gut microbiome, the oral microbiome, and so on. What we found in our systematic review that there are a number of studies, especially now among the more recent sequencing based studies, most studies are cross sectional, which means that. Um, the dysbiosis was assessed at the same time, or the vaginal microbiome status was assessed at the same time as the outcome, which we know is an association but doesn't learn us anything about the direction of the association. So what we did in a, in a, in a second step was to specifically look for what we call longitudinal studies, where we have first the, the repeatedly uh, vaginal microbiome status assessed to whatever method, and then look for various endpoints, being HPV acquisition, but also because most women will get HPV sooner or later, at least once in their lives. The thing is that most of these women will not get cervical cancer. They will clear it through ways that we don't quite understand, but we presume that it is the immune system that clears the, the virus. Part of these women will progress to what we call pre-malignant uh, stages, and that is where we come in with uh, screening strategies. In, especially in low-resource countries, part of these women with pre-malignant lesions will even further progress to cervical cancer, which is actually uh, still uh, the fourth most common cancer in women worldwide. Um, and so we specifically look for studies that address dysbiosis of the vaginal microbiome in relation to all of these uh, different health outcomes. Cervical cancer is, is quite unique within oncology in as much that it is about the only very common cancer that, that is, has proven to be largely preventable due to population-based screening, which is now for decades in use and has uh, been improving uh, even more so as we're moving from uh, cytology-based screening to HPV-based screening as even more sensitive, more accurate. The second, uh, what will eventually, will prevention of, 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 of cervical cancer and premalignant lesions leading to it, will largely rely on, on vaccination strategies. There are new vaccines with more types being um, targeted by, by new vaccines. 
And this is already this is already translated in, in a sharply decreased incidence in the happy few countries like the United States, Scandinavia, Western Europe, Australia, and some parts of uh, Southeast Asia. In most other countries, um, this has not been achieved, and this will not be achieved, I think, for another couple of decades. Is what we were hoping that. Um, for all the time that we can't get vaccines and, and well-established screening programs to those low re resource settings, that we might do it as simple as, as working with probiotics. And I know of one trial that's conducted with a colleague that I collaborate a lot with, Janneke van der Weert. Uh, she's from the University of Liverpool. And she has now, she's finishing up actually such a trial in, in Rwanda. There's not much that we know ab uh, apart from uh, vaginal microbiome dysbiosis when I'm talking about this, the, the regular uh, bacteria, so, uh, so to speak. We know for, for some sexually transmitted infections um, that uh, chlamydia being one of these, um, they may might in, in increase the, the, the risk uh, on the pathway from HPV to cervical uh, cancer, but is, uh, if we be honest, f f the literature base is very limited. I try to, to emphasize on um, study design considerations, that it's as important as, as we want to standardize uh, in, the, in the laboratory protocols to, to go to the sequencing, that designing a good study uh, um, is equally important to make it all this research clinically relevant. And that's something I, I, I see um, that is somewhat missing uh, at, at present.